Hi, please subscribe to my channel to learn more about political philosophy. In this particular video, I'm really hoping you'll stick to the end because this is an attempt to put a lot of things together to answer the question, what's wrong? What's going on right now? Um, right now, we're in the middle of another presidential election, which has surprised um, the media and people who follow these things in how close it is and how divided the United States is still and even during this time of crisis, this time in which we're dealing with a pandemic. Um, so the real question for me is why is there this deep division? And this is what I've been working on for quite some time, trying to attempt to answer this question. And I'm not going to give you the typical surface answer. I think this is part of the problem is that too many times people are giving answers that deal with some sort of immediate thing, whereas I believe that this is a long time in the making, and I think the content on my channel pretty much demonstrates that's what I think. And what I want to do today is kind of pull together some strands that I've been dealing with for a while and show you how this was truly a long time in the making. And it may seem crazy, but I'm gonna go back to the Renaissance and I'm gonna move my way forward. And hopefully this will take about 20 minutes or so. We'll see, but I'm not going to try to make this long, but I need to make it truthful. So where I'm gonna start is with modernity, with the beginning of the modern era. Um, I'm going to place that around the time of the Renaissance and Machiavelli is a good representative of this new modern way of thinking. In this modern way of thinking, people began to decide that rather than having the public, or I mean the government or some you know, religious institution that's public deal with the shaping of our character, trying to tell us how to live, that we would begin to put that just purely into the realm of individual choice, the private sphere, the family, and get it out of the business of government in particular. Machiavelli was, was about that. Now, he was more than just about that, but he did think that, you know, the idea that government should be mainly about trying to shape people's moral, moral character was wrongheaded and caused conflict. And what he thought government was about was pretty simple, maintaining order, right? And doing it in, in a very effective way, even if that meant violating moral rules. Of course, he did say that government should try to make some sort of appearance of morality for the public. And so also he began the process of thinking about how to manipulate people's perceptions and emotions, but not change them. So during this period of time, government became more and more about the narrow and the mundane things, the things that we could actually accomplish, which seems more practical, right? Religious authority and the authority of religion became questionable, and that, of course, escalated during the Protestant Reformation. So it really looked kind of, I don't know, practical to move away from these, um, you know, these mandates of, of morality and religion and government and simply deal with concrete things like how do we make sure we're safe and secure? How do we make sure the, the economy is, is working for people? So, but what happened during this period of time as a result of all this is an elevation of human reason over and against God and nature as forces that impacted uh, the human experience, the human mind. And there was, I would argue, a sort of over-promising as far as the power of what human reason could accomplish. And this starts even with Machiavelli, who basically says, if we can just be rational and we can just follow these rational rules that make sense, we will be able to begin to solve our problems, get away from um, you know, political insecurity and instability and um, you know, poverty and all of these things. Then we have the scientific revolution. Again, in a lot of ways, this is good, certainly practical. Science was meant to deal with concrete problems, with fixing concrete material problems, and it can do that. But 
Almost immediately, we started to ask more of science than it could possibly deliver. And scientists were all about more or less saying that they could deliver more than they possibly could. So, you know, scientists sent the message that what is real is only that which we can see and maybe even only that which we can count. And so science began the process of putting aside a great deal of experienced and known human reality into this sort of subjective area where it's all in your mind. It's a matter of emotions. It's a matter of psychology. Um, and then from there, the scientific perspective began to look at that human being, which was becoming fragmented in between the physical, the psychological, the spiritual, right? And began to look at the psychological and the spiritual components of the human being, which are subjective in this view, as matters for manipulation, as matters also for scientific evaluation and control. So science... Uh, you know, started to look at human beings as subjects in the same way as they did, you know, chemistry, right? The physical elements of the world. And over time, what we find, if we have open eyes, is that science, partly due to this and partly just due to overpromising, helped us human beings create most of the problems that we now find so egregious right? Science was in the mix in all of those problems, whether it's, you know, the development of, of harmful chemicals, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, um, you know, like scientific management, which we've talked about recently. Science is in the midst of climate change, what created it. So in other words, um, science created this sort of, I don't know, um, schizophrenic situation where on the one hand it's right in the mix of causing almost all the problems we're responsible for but it certainly was the tool that we used and also presenting itself as the only solution that no other solution political or spiritual could possibly be as effective as the application of science and so you even get this insistence that we start to apply science to politics and to social and cultural problems. Then we have the full flourishing of this in the Enlightenment, which we place in the 18th century. And at first, the Enlightenment displays this, this belief that with the application of reason, we ought to be able to achieve something like utopia. And that's no doubt an over-promising, but it's still a grand vision right? A grand vision of what human beings could do if they actually put their heads together and stopped being selfish, at least in the narrow sense, and started to think about their long-term self-interest and cooperate, okay? But over time, and not too, not too long in the making, was a lowering or narrowing away from these utopian visions back into a very realistic, type of enlightenment view in which reason sought for the lowest common denominator of human mentality and human behavior because the lowest common denominator is so much more certain. So there was a rejection of wisdom. Wisdom, it, 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 it comes into play um, in attaching itself to human experience to, you know, respect for past experience, right? Things that cannot be seen or that are learned over time that may not be quantifiable. It rejected that in favor of what it called knowledge. And knowledge had to be based on what is seen and quantifiable and low and certain. So things like beauty, goodness, justice, holiness, these sort of high-toned goals, virtues, whatever you want to call them, were redefined as emotive, as sort of projections of the individual psyche, uh, fleeting, but measurable and also uh, manipulatable. Then, out of the Enlightenment, one of the major fruits of it is liberalism. And we're still living in a liberal world. Liberalism is 
I would argue, the foundation for most of the Western world's way of thinking, you know, way of being, thinking about ourselves, how we deal with each other, how we interact, and what our possibilities are. And I've argued that liberalism falsifies the human person as a discrete individual. Uh, Chris Coutrone and I, when we were talking about this, we made this distinction between individual and individualism. And what I'm talking about here in that context is individualism, right? This became the way of thinking about myself and others. We were individuals, discrete, in, made up of both body and psyche. We were more or less atomistic, alone, unable to completely connect with others without simply using our reason and making deals, making contracts of some kind. Liberalism exacerbated this aloneness or atomization by privatizing the spiritual further. You know, it got started with Machiavelli, who recognized that it could be used, the spiritual life could be used to sort of as a source of power, right? But it wasn't something that, that government could really do to like change your soul. Liberals like John Locke, like um, Thomas Hobbes and, and John Locke here, doubled down on this and narrowed it further and basically said, look, we can't deal with this at all. Like government should just stay out of it. And it's a matter of private choice. And ultimately, the, the message seemed to be that it really didn't matter. You know, as a matter of fact, it didn't really matter whether you were religious or not. But if you were going to be religious, that was your own private choice. And you should kind of keep it to yourself as a matter of your opinion. Liberalism decontextualizes through this individualism and privatization of, of all things. It, it takes us out of our social context. It delegitimizes our cultural context. What does that matter? If it matters at all, it's a matter of personal choice and you can join into the culture if you want to. You can also be counterculture. You can also like detach yourself from culture. You can choose a different culture. You can do whatever you want. So, I mean, this sounds liberating, but at the same time, it's alienating. It means that the individual is somehow completely self-made, which doesn't really match up with the way human nature really is. We really are very social creatures. We care about what other people think. And so now we're in this, this constant tension where I'm supposed to make myself and nobody else really is supposed to give a dang about me and really over time doesn't give a dang about what I think unless what I think starts to get in their face, supposedly. But yeah, we really do kind of care at the same time. Um, definitely the, the social dimension of man, therefore, was ignored, downplayed, and even denied, right? I think it was Margaret Thatcher kind of culminated this thought when, he, when she said, more or less, society doesn't exist. But that, that's not our lived reality, even now. And this is partly what causes the pain. Uh, one of the things that causes the pain that people are feeling right now, there's a loss of identity because of this decontextualization. And there's a loss of purpose because without identity, without community and the identity that can give us, where, is, where does our purpose come from outside of our own personal self-expression and fulfillment? Which, as you all know, I'm sure, only goes so far to satisfy you. You think you've got it, then the next day you wake up and you still don't feel very good about it. And then we get the flourishing of capitalism out of the liberal framework, a particular kind of trade, a trade in which our social relations become relations between things. Now, this is very difficult for people to deal with, especially if they tend to have thrived under capitalism, right, materially. Um, and they don't think capitalism is, is all that bad. And nothing is all bad, right? Uh, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that this is a truth, that capitalism alienates us further from each other by turning a lot of our relations with each other into relations among things. So in a concrete sense, this means that so much of the human's life and day is really about more or less getting the things that you need and kind of arranging your life accordingly, you know, making sure you can eat, making sure you have a place to sleep, hopefully, a roof over your head, sustenance, right? That if you don't know 
the people involved in supplying those things and you don't whatever you're providing you don't know where it's going right um all you know is what you can get the thing that you can get you have lost a great deal of human relations that would have to be made up somehow if we were going to adopt this way of economy we would have to make up the social relations in order to not feel the loss of them. But we didn't do that. We doubled down on isolation. We basically thought that if we could get these things anonymously, if we had enough money, that we didn't really need to have those human relations. Because they're inconvenient, because they get in the way of, of our, our complete um, individual autonomy. So capitalism does that. It's alienating in that way. And it would have to be dealt with. And we haven't dealt with that. Okay, it prioritizes profit and growth at the expense of culture, community, family, and appreciation of beauty, goodness, justice, and holiness. And all of that, as we've been talking about lately in the McCarrahair series, is a type of mammonism. It's shifting your focus from, you know, the, the internal reality, from this perspective anyway, of the person towards something superficial and something fleeting, profit and growth. And maybe those two things, these, all these things can't like harmoniously coexist, even though a lot of American Christians want to believe that they do. But capitalism dissolves loyalty bonds of family, extended family and community. And we ought to be able to see this with clear eyes because it literally splits up families, money problems cause divorce, children move away and don't come back. Sometimes couples even live in different cities so that they can further their careers or just to make a living. Sometimes people go to another country as an immigrant and leave their family simply so that they can survive. Um, and so, I mean, obviously, it is not the best system for creating the stability necessary for family and community to thrive. Again, if we were going to still have capitalism, we would at least have to deal with these negative consequences, consequences instead of living in a fairy tale where they are not consequences and everything's fine. It's not fine. Um, in addition, and maybe even most importantly, capitalism makes our livelihoods inherently precarious. In a capitalist system, there is ultimately no guarantee of a continued ability to make a living. And this gets worse, of course, the worse the economy is, but the reality is everyone's precarious. All right, unless we Unless we did something about that, unless we changed our economic arrangements in such a way that people didn't feel this sort of deep down insecurity, again, we will have problems. We have to acknowledge uh, the reality of the effects of the capitalist system. Automation is a fruit of the capitalist system, right? Now, here's I Love Lucy, right? She kind of made fun of it in a way. But that scene from that old show it also like sums up the the anxiety the the sense of just overwhelming oppression like i have anxiety when i drive on a freeway in multi lane traffic right and i get boxed in there's a car ahead behind to the right and i'm going 80 miles an hour i'm like i'm going to have a panic panic attack you know, because I feel like I've got no place to go. And this was Lucy's feeling. And I think anybody who lives in a world of automation, whether it's still faculty, faculty well, okay, factory automation, or whether it's, um, you know, like office automation, where everything's timed, where you're where your every move is being recorded, where, you know, or like in your Amazon warehouse when, you know, it, you know, your metrics are constantly measured. How, how long does it take to, to get box A from here to, to over there? I mean, this is an incredible amount of pressure. It makes people feel like they are, which is interchangeable and expendable um, cogs and machine. Okay. Again, if we were going to still benefit from the fruits of automation without it creating a situation where it pits man against machine and creates an incredible amount of, of, of anxiety, we would have to do something about that. We would have to compensate somehow. We'd have to acknowledge the dehumanization and then do something outside of that setting. 
not not the the bogus humanization of the workplace, but something outside of that setting in which society compensated. I don't know if it can be done, but we'd have to do it um, or else we will continue to get the alienation and anxiety and anger caused by automation, which throws people out of work. And also, as we've seen discussing McCarahare's book, it is often treated as this sort of godlike thing that, you know, seduces us into believing that tech- technology and automation itself are, are gods that can, like, ultimately get us out of all the problems that we have. But meanwhile, the reality is, again, we have to realize it. They make more problems, you know, because that automation in and of itself is a tool and we have abnegated responsibility um, for using it appropriately. Then we have corporate power, right? Corporate power means that responsibility is fragmented, right? That there's no one person, no one office that you can go to and say, hey, you've polluted my, my stream. You've, like, you've created a situation in my house like where my water is poisoning me or you know, I can't farm in my, in my, on my land uh, because you've wiped out my crop or whatever it is. Um, you know, Rachel Carson pointed this out back in the 60s, right? That corporate power doesn't have, doesn't have like an interest in being responsible and it's fragmented, it's all over the place, it can shift here and there, um, and it can't be held responsible. We'd have to hold it responsible uh, politically, which is hard to do, but possible, but we don't have the political will to do that. And a big point I want to make is that the corporate structure, corporate power has become so great It supplies so many of our needs. It employs so many of us. It conditions our day through its, really its control of of media, including social media, because that's who pays for it, that it has become more government than our government. And it's a government that you can't change. Government is that which controls your behavior, that sets the rules, that sets sets the rules for how you're gonna live your life, what you're gonna value, you know, And so this is a form of government, and it's outside of our democratic control. It is unchecked material, cultural, spiritual, and behavioral power, and people feel that, and they feel that their vote doesn't really have the effect. As much as I'm, you know, I applaud the fact that so many people in the United States got out and voted, I think that there's a general sense that's developed that votes don't really produce meaningful change. And I'm suggesting that this is a part of it, that the government has gotten beyond the official government by a lot. So it's not even just a matter of like political corruption. It's a matter of how much authority and power, corporate power has over, over our daily lives. It's integrated with our destiny because now at this point, um, if corporations fail, we fail. All right. It has become such a predominant part of our lives that if the stock market go down, goes down, even if you don't own a stock to save your life, your job could be cut. Um, your, your life could be completely up, upended. So it affects all of us and it is beyond our choice, or at least it seems to be beyond our will to stop or to control. Environmental destruction that corporations cause also we can't stop. We give ourselves fairy tales about how, you know, we ought to be able to stop the effect of this by, by like, not using plastic bags or plastic drinking straws. And believe me, I don't want you to use either one of them, but this is not going to save the world and everybody knows it, right? And it's very difficult to stop them any other way. This is a huge problem. Again, do we have the ability, using science and even corporate power, to restructure things in such a way that we don't have to cause such massive pollution that we have to worry about climate change? Yes, we absolutely do. That's the tragedy of the situation. They have created enough knowledge, enough structure, enough science and enough technology that we could do all those things. But but there's no concerted interest outside of a certain amount of interest through the political process, 
right? So this is very difficult and people feel helpless. They feel helpless. Even if they care about the environment, they're likely to say, oh, I don't care. You know why? Because if I do care and if enough people care at this point, I'm going to lose my job. And that's a legitimate concern. And it's one that's not being addressed, um, not by Democrats very effectively and not by anybody. Then we have technocracy. All right. It was an outgrowth of all of this, right, in which the experts become ever more powerful. Technocracy puts in charge the experts in human manipulation, the ones that have scientifically broken down the human beings into these uh, component parts, which we are not, the, psycho the industrial psychologists, the administrators, the managers. And I'm sorry if you are one, this is not your fault either. This is a systemic issue. But our system now says that you should not be in charge of your life they're in charge because they know better. Well, it shouldn't surprise us that people are angry, that deep down inside they feel resentment of this technocracy, this, this sort of claim to authority of these scientists, these technicians, these psychologists, these managers. And so, you know, McCara Hare calls the, these people the technocrat technocratic clerisy, right? The, the clerics, the priests, the ministers, the people in this new religion who kind of are the intermediaries, right? The ones that know better, the ones that should teach us. But they don't seem to have as much authority, nor should they, since they really aren't gods or attached to God. At least the clerics, though they've lost an awful lot of um, their cachet, could claim to be attached to an intermediating, intermediating for something higher. Um, but we all know that the experts are often wrong. We know that deep down. And, and this is coming out in a deep resentment and an overblown suspicion of even the simplest of scientific pronouncements. Remember, you know, what science really good at? Dealing with concrete physical problems. What's it not good at? Maybe telling you how you should live your life in every regard. Making prognostications about things that it can't ultimately prove. Okay, so now we have this deep resentment of the technocrats and a further feeling that the scope of our democratic action, uh, action is reduced because they are in charge of so much beyond our vote. And then you get social media on top of that. Why do we have social media? Well, I mean, science and technology also gave us social media, right? And capitalism, technocracy, all of these things gave us social media. And why do we have social media for real? It's because social media can sell us stuff. It's part of the capitalist system. It's, it's, it's part of the management of us at this point, right? It can push our buttons. It's part of government. Now, it may not be like a concerted, you know, conspiracy of any kind. I don't think it is, all right? But it functions in this way. And it thrives on and produces more conflict because it gets you to come back. That's why, that's why it exists. Why does it want you to come back? Because that way it can sell advertisements. That's why, okay? Just like cable TV continues to exist because it makes its money off of advertisements. So, you know, if, if a train wreck will get you to keep watching, it's going to give you more train wrecks. And if nasty screeds on Facebook are going to keep appalled people coming back for more because they just can't help it because it's so horrible, then they're going to allow that, all right? Um, social media, sadly, I'm not a total, I, you know, like I use it, but I try to use it judiciously. But let's face it, it favors the stupid over the profound. It favors the people who can only spend maybe 10 seconds to 20 seconds because they've been conditioned to do that, right? Not because they're really stupid, but because it makes us stupid. And so it favors the stupid statements over the profound, which take longer, which we, many of us, are capable of absorbing, but, <laughs> but, but we aren't allowed to, or we're strongly encouraged to, you know, um, uh, consume the stupid instead. 
it emphasizes the moment over the long term and you can't have wisdom and you can't come up with decent solutions and you can't think about your fellow human being that you disagree with profoundly and think about well what point could they possibly have that's right that we could agree on you can't do any of that if you're just thinking in the short term and not in the long run because in the long run you'd start thinking about gosh you know are my children going to be able to survive in this world are we ever going to be able to work together to build anything again you know and so it amplifies the spectacle for profit in other words and it diverts our souls our spiritual side it really kind of kills them a lot of these forces are out to kill your spirit and um, they're not all bad but only if the human spirit revives and figures out how to use them for the human good. Okay? We've got so much to work with. So anyway, to sum up, why do we have this re rebellion going on right now in our world? Both on the right and on the left. On a lot of different areas of the spectrum, we're seeing it acting out all over the place and in, in around the world. Why is it? I would suggest that, among other things, a very strong element is a rebellion against authority, a rebellion against perceived illegitimate authority, a rebellion against illegitimate authority, okay? There's been a loss of respect for people, and people feel it, a loss of respect from the economy, from the corporations, from the technocrats, from the government, the politicians, the media. There's a loss of respect for human beings in the process because they're being treated like anything but human beings. They're consumers, they're, they're widgets, they're cogs, they're things to manipulate, okay? Um, and you can insult them uh, repeatedly and expect them to come back and back. What does that say? What does that say about who respects you? Like when you're being insulted repeatedly, when your intelligence is being insulted. There's a loss of identity because of the rapid change and the changes that I've talked about concerning the family and the community, the breakdown of culture. There's a loss of identity, meaning people don't feel like they have a place in this world where they can feel comfortable, accepted, and respected. And we want that. We all are living with this economic precarity. So there's a sense that, you know, the authorities keep telling us to believe that they have the answers, but yet things don't get better. We're not more secure. We don't feel happier. This precarity needs to be addressed. Probably the most concrete thing we can do, and this is an area I agree with Chris Coutron on, um, and everybody like him, is this is the area, the concrete area we could tackle first, that if we did, would begin to elicit perhaps more of a sense of respect, more of a sense of belonging, and might actually eventually fix some of the other problems that grieve us so much, like the destruction of the family and the community. If we could stop that by giving people the means to stay put, by not making it an absolute imperative to do whatever it takes just to be able to feed themselves. If we could do that, then maybe we could address some of the sense of dehumanization and begin to create a context in which we could fill the spiritual void, even though that can't be done by economic measures alone. And that's why I have been considering what I consider to be at this point a fact that we need to reconsider our economic arrangements, that we need to have an open conversation about socialism. We need to understand what it really means and not cower in the past and act like this is a Cold War issue. The Cold War is over. This is a different world and we need to grapple with the realities of this and use our human power, which we do have, to finally make things better for ourselves instead of what we're doing now, which is obviously ruining our societies, ruining our cultures, ruining our environment, and making it very difficult for people to be happy. All right. Thanks for listening.